Okay, so I will uh, uh, welcome everybody. So this is the uh, last meeting of this CASP uh, AI Zooms before summer. Uh, and I guess the people are a bit busy with CASP seasons, so at least for the next two months, I thought we have a break. And let, but if someone wants to organize a seminar, you're welcome. And you can use this link or another link. Um, and uh, as always, there are uh, two other seminar series. I think there is an RNA meeting next week, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe maybe not. Uh, actually, maybe not. I don't know when the next meeting. I think they also have a bit of break, so they might be a bit of break there also. So I'm not sure when the next meetings are. But I think we're all busy doing cast predictions, so that might be good with the break. break. Uh, and we will be back uh, in September, uh, on September 10 with Debbie Marks giving a talk. I don't have a title yet, but I'll try to figure that out. But today we have uh, Cecilia Clementi, who is going to talk about uh, how to use machine learning to improve potentials for proteins and other things, I guess. And yeah, so please go ahead and welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. Let me try to share my screen. One second. Um, I think you should be allowed to share. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Sure. Do you see it? Yes, perfect. Yes. yes. Oh, man. Um, what did I do here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to present here. Um, I don't do structure prediction, but I guess uh, what I do is complementary. So I'm mm, I'm uh, very happy to have the chance to present it to this audience. So um, I want to put things in context and um, I try to explain why I do what I do. Uh, we have this idea that uh, if you consider molecular systems, they are in between a few atoms and the bulk. So if we have just a few atoms, like a single water molecule, you know what to do, you know what you need to use, you need to use them like the highest resolution, like solving the Schrodinger equation, you want to have the electronic structure that gives you all the properties. And um, if you have the other extreme, uh, if you are uh, um, in the bulk uh, regime, if you have like uh, an infinite number of water molecules, you are not interested in the electronic structure of each one of them. You're interested in the phase diagram. So you're interested in different variables and you use different methods uh, to characterize it. So there is a different focus and different resolution if you consider just one molecule, if you atoms or a bulk. And I would say that for large macromolecular system, we are in between because we have interfaces, we have uh, intermediate sizes, not bulk, and there is heterogeneity and there are solute and solvents and so on. And so it's not clear what are the relevant variables, what resolution we need. And um, my goal is to design models with the minimal resolution, the resolution that is uh, uh, sufficient to get uh, what we want, like to try to understand dynamic and function, but not more than that. And uh, I have this idea since many years that I think atomistic resolution may be too fine. Maybe we can go much coarser than that. So um, this is not just to speed up simulation, but also to generate understanding, because if we can reduce the complexity, we can understand what's important, what's not important. So uh, we do this uh, to by coarse graining, and we design models at different resolution with reduced structural complexity and increased simulation efficiency. And we do that with machine learning, as I'll explain. So the main problem here, as you uh, may know, is that when we start from uh, the finest resolution, like in principle, you can start from like 
trying to solve the Schrodinger equation for a protein in solvent, that's impossible, but um, at least you can get snapshot and do some DFT calculation with them. In principle, you could try to do first principle. So you have a first principle potential. Now you can take a machine learning potential that is trained on first principle data. So in principle, you can have a, um, a very accurate potential at this at the finest resolution. But if you start to course on it, you don't know what's happening to the potential. You don't know if you lose the 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 physics information to construct a, a physics based potential. So how do we design it? How do we um, how do we pick a potential an energy function that does the job? Depends what you want to do. And there are different approaches. You can go um, top down. You can like Martini. You may want to try to reproduce I don't know, uh, free energy differences or between uh, free energy solvation, something like that. And this is what Martini does. Um, you may want to do structure prediction, and there are course grade models for that. And that is just looking at the structure, not uh, the thermodynamics. And or you may want to do uh, a bottom up. Uh, approach, trying to reproduce uh, finer models. And uh, I'll start to talk about the bottom-up approach, and if I have time, I'll tell you something what we do on the top-down. So the bottom-up approach means that we want to reduce the resolution, so it means that uh, we do a dimensionality reduction. We take an old region in the atomistic configurational space, and we map it into a point into the coarse configurational space. We do that through a mapping operator that takes the Cartesian space of the atomistic representation. So a vector here is the 3N coordinates of all the N atoms in a protein, solvent, everything uh, that is, the, is governed by this potential that is given by, I don't know, amber charm, whatever, that we assume is good. And uh, you map it into a reduced representation where you, um, this is a linear mapping, so you, for instance, take only part of the atoms. You can, like, and usually we do this very aggressively. We go from, I don't know, if you take a large protein in a water box, you may have millions of coordinates and you, we map it to a few dozens. Um, and the question is, how do we design this potential? Well, the requirement is that we want to reproduce the same thermodynamics. So we want to reproduce the same free energy surfaces. So we want uh, we want this to be a Boltzmann distribution. We know, I mean, we generate the data um, with this potential uh, according to a Boltzmann distribution. And we want this to be a Boltzmann distribution and the, distrib and the distribution needs to match. This is so-called uh, thermodynamic uh, consistency. We want the thermodynamic means the being the same, means the free energy needs to be the same. And um, in order to do that, the only possibility is for this potential, this coarse grain potential, to be uh, given by the marginal probability of the atomistic potential. This, if you, if you satisfy these equations here, means that the thermodynamics is the same. The thermodynamics of the coarse grain model is the same as the thermodynamics of the more uh, uh, fine grain model. But this can be written, this uh, is a unique uh, potential, but it cannot be computed in practice because these integrals are pretty nasty. And this integral is on the atomistic variable. So this is an integral over millions of dimensions that is impossible to do in practice. And uh, it cannot be estimated uh, numerically. Uh, it would require to have the partition function of the system. Uh, and uh, so this is explained, for instance, in a, in a low dimensional example, if we have this two dimensional potential and we are interested only in the X dimension, we can project it. And this is the thermodynamically consistent 1D potential that reproduces the same thermodynamics in the X direction as this uh, two dimensional potential. And this is done with these equations. In this case, can be done numerically because it's just 2D for 1D, but we want to do it for proteins. So uh, with this can be rewritten in variationally. This is this work that it was done in the 90s and 2000s, uh, most in the 2000s, I would say. 
by Craig Voss and, uh, and Will Noid and collaborators. And it was shown that the same potential U that uh, gives thermodynamic consistency is also the potential that is the absolute minimum of this function R. Fun absolute minimum when this U uh, can span the whole functional space of integrable function. So you need to have you need to have a very flexible and uh, expressive form of U if you want to use this variational principle. This has been used in the past with very restrictive forms of U, like uh, plugging in the same functional form that you have for the atomistic potential. This is also what Martini does, for instance. You take the same functional form and you plug it in U. Martini is not bottom up, but many people doing core screen model use the same functional form. And this, uh, for us, this is uh, not correct because we know that this, in this integral changes the functional form and introduces multi-body terms. And uh, so we need uh, an expressive way of represent a multi-body function, a dimensional multi-body function. Um, and this is perfect for neural network because we neural networks can be considered um, universal function approximators. So instead of a function, we put the neural network at this place of view. And to explain this uh, loss function that we minimize so then the variational principle becomes a loss function from data. And uh, this is the projection of the coordinates into the coarse grain space. And this is the projection of the force, the atomistic force on the tangent space of the coordinates. And uh, some work we have done uh, recently showed that these two mapping, they are both linear, but they don't need to be the same. For instance, in this case, uh, we have as a mapping for the coordinates, we just pick the carbon alpha, for instance, we just throw everything else um, away. And for the mapping of um, the uh, forces, we take these, uh, where every, all the atoms contribute. And this is okay, actually needs to be done uh, for this to work. And if you're interested, I can tell you more about that. But so we've done a lot of, um, theory work to work on with this in practice. And so we, with all of these, uh, this is what we proposed in 2019. Um, basically, we have a uh, mm, mm, neural network as a force field, approxim uh, force field approximation, or more, better a force field correction, because we put a lot of energy term that we know, for instance, bond angles, uh, dihedrals, uh, uh, excluded volume into the prior energy. And then we we introduce the multi-body terms with um, this neural net, what we call free energy net. And so what the neural network does, you um, input the coarse grain coordinate, gives you an energy in terms of the coarse grain coordinate, then you take the gradient, you get the forces, you put the forces into, sorry, this uh, expression here, this is the force, the gradient of potential, so it's the force, you put it in here, and if you have a lot of instantaneous or atom forces, you can minimize this uh, uh, on data, and you can find the form of U that minimizes this functional from data, and this is uh, the, uh, the best approximation you can have given the data on uh, the thermodynamically consistent coarse grain potential. To show you an example of how this work, this is what we can do, for instance, for the small protein signaling is only 10 atoms. So we consider we retain only the carbon alpha. So we have 30 degrees of freedom. And even if it's a small protein, if you solvate it and uh, want to simulate folding and folding, first of all, it takes a very long time, even if it's small, because you need a large box when it unfolds. And uh, you still have um, several thousand degrees of freedom. And this is what you get with the atom in doing months of simulations. And this is what we get with if we use our potential, our machine learning potential from the data. Uh, and then we simulate with the machine learning potential. And this is very fast because there's only 30 degrees of freedom and you can do it in a matter of hours. You can reproduce the same free energy landscape with the folded state, unfolded state, and misfolded state. Um, and I would say in a very quantitative way. In fact, if this is a two reaction coordinate, 
that can separate the state. And if you project on just these two reaction coordinates, you see the error is within one, kilo, one kilocalorie per mole. It doesn't make sense to be more accurate than one, one kilocalorie per mole because even the atomistic force field are not uh, so accurate. So, and also they have sampling errors and so on. So with this, we showed that um, we can design, we can interpolate. When this is, was designed for one protein to work with one protein signaling. We can work with uh, 12 proteins at the same time. We can design a potential so in a transferable way such that with the same parameter, we can uh, fold uh, 12 proteins at the same time. This we did in collaboration with Gianni De Fabrizis and Frank Noe. We published it last year. And now we have uh, a really, really transferable potential, meaning that we design on a set of proteins and then we can simulate other proteins that don't have anything to do with the training data. So this took a lot of time and effort from my group um, and collaborators. And uh, we, well, a lot of time was in designing the data set from which to learn the potential and uh, also in the design of this physical prior, the design of the neural network, and then the validation set. So the data set is composed of 50 proteins uh, spanning the CAF uh, database, um, trying to maximize diversity in sequence and structure and keeping the, the size relatively small and uh, a lot of fragments. Mm, a lot of simulation of uh, interacting fragments at uh, different distances. And we, we put all of these into the training set. We have forces for all of this so we can learn with this variational principle. And uh, then we simulate proteins that have nothing to do with this protein from which we learn. And these are the ones we have tried. And these are all, uh, uh, most of them are fast folders. So we can have uh, atomistic simulation to compare to. We don't use the atomic simulation for training, but what we compare. And you see, this is the sequence overlap, and particularly for the larger protein, it has nothing to do, it's very small, it doesn't have um, much uh, similarity with the training probe proteins. And um, for instance, if you take, um, again, signaling, this is with different atomistic force field. It's not, it's not the same as before, but this is the reference and the, the Korsky model that has never seen signaling during the training can reproduce the same folded, unfolded, misfolded. It's smoother because it's coarse grain than the atom, but we represent the same metastable state and the same transition. And uh, we can do it for many proteins. Uh, this is a comparison of uh, these uh, four proteins, signaling, trip cage, VBA, and VLIN. We can fold all of them and uh, uh, we can represent the landscape. This is a comparison of our model with all atom simulation. And you see we have the same minima and we span the same space. So not only we get the correct folded state, but we get also unfolding and misfolding and so on. And this is a comparison with alternative state-of-the-art methods in course training um, that do not use machine learning. And you see most of the time they do not fold the protein and uh, or they don't explore, even if we fold it, they don't explore the whole landscape. Uh, our goal is to characterize the whole landscape as you do with the atomistic simulation, but at the fraction of the cost. And we can do much larger protein that cannot be simulated with the atom in any reasonable time. We can simulate it with our model. And then we compare, we, we, should, we fold them. So we compare with the crystal structure and it's pretty good, the folded state, but we also generate unfolded state uh, 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 if you simulate long enough. And um, this is an example, for instance, on this protein alpha 3D that is very stable. So we start with the worst possible configuration. We take the completely elongated chain, the sequence in a, in a, in a linear uh, polymer and we let it go and uh, uh, it, it forms the secondary structure first and then it starts to try to pack it and then it, it's folded and it stays in the folded state uh, forever. Um, it does some excursion in the unfolded state but this is very stable. It's the downhill folded. This is a design protein. It's designed to be very stable. Uh, 
and we can do it for other proteins like ubiquitin. You see the tail is very flexible. The rest of the protein is just moving around the crystal structure. We can do it for large proteins. We don't have the atomistic comparison with this. We can compare, we can do some uh, short simulation in the folded state with the lasom and we compare the fluctuations. And even if uh, in our model, the fluctuations are smoother, like for alpha 3D, for instance, we get the same trend. We get the same uh, features. Uh, the parts that are more flexible in the olatum are more flexible in the coarse grain. Uh, and the parts that are more rigid are more rigid in the coarse grain. We can also do intrinsic disorder proteins because we don't have the, the time constraint. I mean, this is a very fast simulation once you have the you have trained the coarse grain model. So we can do uh, this intrinsic disorder protein. Um, and uh, this is the landscape we get as a function of two reaction coordinate. We compare with, uh, we have 25 NMR structure that are these gray crosses. And there, if you see the, this big basin we get uh, collects, um, this is from our simulation, we reproduce all the 25 uh, NMR structures, but also we get an alternative state that is very metastable. So this is a very shallow minimum with respect to this one is like uh, six kilocalorie per mole, uh, six KBT or more um, higher than this minimum. And uh, the transition is very slow. So we never see it with the Latum simulation and we can see it with our model. And we are now investigating if this is real or is an artifact of the model and it looks like it's real. So if you take in atomistic force field, we try with different force fields, and you put it here, even in a, the force field for intrinsic disorder proteins, and you start with the coarse grain simulation that were uh, that they found this this state, and you start from here, you stay here with the olatum simulation. So it's metastable. You never see it going anywhere because the olatum is too too slow. But we we with our model, we can see it going back and forth. Um, and okay, let me go. So this, we are very happy about this. We, are, we have several collaboration with experimentalists to try to characterize different systems. Now, one other thing we are doing, we are trying to interpret these force fields. We um, collaborate with Klaus Robert Mueller uh, from uh, Berlin, and uh, uh, we discovered that in uh, machine learning, they have this so-called layer-wise relevance propagation that in physics term is basically multi-body expansion. They have a way at the nodes, uh, at, each, at each node, they do a Taylor expansion and then they propagate it. And so you have a multi body expansion of uh, the neural network. You can read it in terms of one body, two body, three bodies interaction. And um, we can do, for instance, for um, uh, I'm going to show you out uh, here, I've showed two results. Uh, I, I, we train different neural network. Uh, now we have even more neural network. Um, first, we did it for coarse graining water because it's simpler. And methane, this is methane. And uh, different neural network give the same, reproduce the same radial distribution function. Water is more complicated. So I would focus on the neural network that works, that is maze. Now we have a other neural network, as I said, but uh, Schnett doesn't work in this case. So these are different architectures. So uh, the results of Schnett are not really relevant. But and then we lo do look at the interpretation. And for instance, if you look at the two body, inter uh, the two body interaction, you get that for methane is purely repulsive, is a repulsive core, and that makes sense because it's an hydrophobic uh, solute. Um, and um, for water, instead, there is a deep attraction in the at the, at the position of the hydrogen bonding. Um, the position, the distance of two um, 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 oxygen corresponding to an oxygen bonding. And uh, this is makes physical sense. And if you look at three-body interaction, methane doesn't have three-body interaction. Two-body interactions are enough. And in fact, we can train a two-body potential to reproduce methane properties, structure and thermodynamics. While for uh, water, we need three-body potential we have significant three body interactions. These are attractive interactions. Negative means attractive, and uh, they have minima corresponding to the angles of uh, the uh, tetrahedron that water tends to form. 
uh, and we can look at higher order interaction that for author are in, important, but methane two bodies enough. And this analysis, this multi-body decomposition tells you which, which body order is relevant for um, a given molecule. So we can do it for proteins as well. This is for uh, this protein and TN9. And uh, we train a coarse grain model to reproduce the main features of the landscape. Um, and uh, we then look at the two bot interpretation. These are, um, this is, a, this is basically a contact map where you can see the secondary structure in this protein. And uh, the two bot interpretation reproduces the contact map. So you have strong contacts mostly, uh, a few very attractive contacts uh, that form the secondary structure. Some very weak uh, repulsive contacts, but then we can look also at the three body and so on. And we can uh, uh, okay look at the different pathways. You find that in different metastable states, you have different contacts that are important. This metastable state stabilizes this uh, uh, beta um, um, beta uh, sheets and this um, uh, metastable state stabilizes alpha helices and this other um, partly this other beta sheet and. Um, we can do mutations because for us, mutation is just switching the identity of an amino acid. We have only carbon alpha, so it's very simple. And um, uh, we can look at what would happen in these uh, two body interactions that we extract from the model when we do the mutation. And we see, for instance, if you mutate um, leucine 35 into an alanine, you mainly disrupt the interaction between this leucine 35 and the alpha helix, in particular, the strongest is with uh, um, leucine 30. And it's known in the literature that uh, this is uh, important for the folding. And um, we can mutate, for instance, val valine 3. We mutate it into uh, a tryptophan. And so basically, we introduce a different amino acid here. And we see the disruption of the packing of uh, with the with the, the beta sheet, uh, by uh, you, you should see that this uh, particular interaction here are uh, and also yeah um, this is symmetric. So this particular interaction here are disrupted with this mutation. So we can really interpret this potential as they were, you know, written as a functional form because we can do this decomposition. Um, okay. Um, this is what we are doing for um, the bottom-up approach, but eventually we want to predict uh, experiments. We don't want to predict only atomistic simulation that may be inac inaccurate, uh, not accurate enough for certain proteins. For instance, they, there are no force fields that can are very good for both um, intrinsically disordered proteins and global proteins and so on. So we always make approximations in all atom simulations and uh, um if we want the our potential to be able to overcome this approximation so we need to also inject experimental data into the model and the way we are injecting experimental data is through this uh, uh, maximum likelihood approach that we published a few years ago the idea is that we have any uh Coarse grain potential. In this case, you can have, we can, okay, you have like local terms, non local terms, and this can be a neural network uh, and uh, with parameters. And um, we uh, like write a likelihood of this model as a function of the parameters, this likelihood of reproducing a set of experimental data, F, experimental observable F with the corresponding error bar uh, delta f. So basically, this is the Gaussian. If you are within the error bar, you're close to 1. If you are very far from the uh, experimental value with respect to the error bar, you're close to 0. And so then we multiply the likelihood for each observable. And in principle, you can also combine observable from different uh, experiments like FRET and uh, mutagenesis, whatever. Um, and um, 
uh, then we maximize, we use the machine learning um, machinery to maximize this likelihood, basically minimize the minus uh, um, log uh, likelihood. Um, and then we, we find the parameters, the optimal parameters that uh, give the best, uh, um, uh, best uh, agreement with the experimental data. I mean, we, the, the main trick here is to express the observable as a function of the model parameters. And we can do this through perturbation theory, but this is just a detail. Um, we have applied it uh, uh, in this paper, we applied it to some proof of principle simulation. And um, this can be, needs to be done iteratively because um, when you optimize the model, you need to check, we need to do simulations with this optimized model, and then you may have to correct again and that iteratively go to the maximum likelihood. You want the likelihood as, uh, as close to one as possible. So for instance, this is a way to uh, check the effect of mutations. The, the mean, you can take experimental data um, measuring the difference in stability upon mutation. Again, we use perturbation theory to um, to evaluate the, the difference in free energy, the delta delta Gs upon mutation, stability or transition state uh, um, differences um, between the mutant and the wild type. And uh, we can do this in our model and uh, we can take the experimental data delta delta Gs and plug it into this um, method here. And for instance, we tried first to see how far can we go with the two body only interactions? And we try two proteins, ubiquitin and protein G. Um, and we use the carbon alpha model only. And as you see here, we can train ubiquitin even with the two body only interaction to reproduce the experimental data quite well. This is the agreement between the calculated and the experimental delta delta G. The error bar are quite small in this case. Um, and this is the uh, the minus log likelihood. But if you take uh, more data and you take, for instance, protein G, you see that you cannot do it with the two body model only, although it's very flexible, it's just blind, so it's the most general two body interactions. You don't, uh, you have a scatter plot that doesn't correspond to the diagonal, you get a much better agreement if you introduce many body terms. Here we introduce it manually with this functional form that is basically taking into account of uh, the, um, the surrounding by the dense, using the density around each residue. So this is just an approximation, it's not a real network. And even just introducing many body terms, you get much closer you see a much significant improvement in uh, the agreement, especially if you look at where this um, improvement is, is in position that are uh, exposed to the solvent. And uh, this means that in order to capture the effect of the solvent that we, we don't, this is implicit solvent, our modeling. So in order to capture the effect of the solvent, you need to have multiple body terms. And this is not surprising. And now, because this can be done with any functional form. Uh, here, we can put any functional form. Now we are doing it with the neural network. So the idea is to train a neural network and then correct with the experimental data. Um, and uh, with this, um, I can keep going uh, and tell you other things, but I would like to stop here and uh, take questions. Uh, if you want, I, as I said, I have more material to present, but um, um, the, our ultimate goal is to be able to train coarse grain model, minimalist model, as simple as possible. We don't know yet what's the resolution we can push to, but we hope at least carbon alpha. And uh, train it with the Latum simulation and the experimental data together. So combining top down and bottom up and be able to not only fold proteins to the correct native structure, but also uh, simulate the whole landscape if, if there are um, uh, fold switches and things like this. And with this, um, I would like to thank all my group and uh, the funding sources and my collaborators.
And I have um, several postdoctoral positions available if you have anybody who may be interested. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I can start with questions unless someone else you may just go ahead and raise your hand or shout out. But I so if I understand you correctly, the, the read for these multi-body terms is because you don't have a, a good model for uh, implicit or explicit solvent or for, yeah, is that because like in, in Martini you don't need it or like in dry martini. Well, Martini course. cannot fold the protein. No, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, I will... so, so. Martini is maybe used for membranes, but if you want, if you take a sequence, I'd like what I showed you here. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Well, I, I, I don't know what Martini will do with like uh, villain or something like that. If you take, it, but... no, if you take Martini and you put it here, we've we done it because the referee asked yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't go anywhere. I mean, okay. Any of these globular proteins I showed you, if you put them in Martini, if, and if you put them in the fold state, they completely dissolve. Because Martini cannot fold the protein. It's not designed for that. Okay. So, you, so you think we need, because in MD, of course, you don't, you don't, you don't have, or most MD force fields do not have uh, any three body terms, they only have two body terms. But this is all but atomistic. Then, yeah. This atomistic, is, yeah. we start from atomistic, don't need, no, not need um, multi body, unless you want to call, take into account yeah. quantum effects. But well, as soon as you go to coarse grained, you because of this, int you need because of this integral. It's mathematically proved. Yeah, yeah. Because of this integral here, if you want to reproduce the same landscape, you need multi-body term. Okay, so it's, it's just not only the, the solution; it's even in the, between the pairs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, then we need to analyze what are the most important, of course, but yeah. uh, mathematically proved that you need. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I and I mean, that because of your top down and bottom up thing, potentials. Is there any similarity or how, how, how I mean, if you look at the potentials later, I mean, they are forced to start from completely different angles, oh, but so the, is, is the goal that they should converge to something? Yeah, that they should unified, converge, unified they, that top, uh, top down and bottom up. Yeah. Can you can you measure that, how far they are from each other? We, have, uh, we are working on it right now. Okay. We okay. don't know yet. We don't know, yeah, in fact, it's, I mean, of course, obviously they should converge, but it, yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, it's, it's not clear. <laughs> yeah, but we'll be interested to see. It's, it's I mean, if the atomistic simulation are completely inconsistent with the sure, experimental sure. Yeah, data, yeah. they don't converge. But if there is, if the atomistic simulation are, are decent, they should converge. Yeah, and you, and your simulations was mainly small, small peppers that you can completely yeah. solve so up to yeah. million or so. Yeah, yeah. Because of yeah. course, you, you you don't use like a simulation of bigger proteins because that's no. No, not, you need you need a full. Uh, ensemble basically to be able to do it. Yeah. No, no, we need, we can do it. Uh, now we are working on the methods and you don't need, we've showed that you don't need the full ensemble. Okay. You can need just pieces, um, but you need diversity. You need many. Okay, yeah. So you can do some MCMC and then you sample around and you could. Because I mean, you, you, need... you, you have like a, a fast full deposit from uh, Creston and these things to. Uh, uh, that's no, right. we don't use those. Uh, these are our yeah. test. Yeah. Okay. We so do simulation. We need use it to test it because we have the comparison. We have okay. the atomistic comparison. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. I see. I see. I see. Because otherwise, I guess there are. I don't know. I mean, I'm not up to date, but like there are, have been simulations like that. We yeah, do man. our own simulation. We have a big database of simulation now after okay, okay. years of working on this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the from the other people? Uh, have, have you tried to run it on bigger systems? Like, um, what happens? Yeah. Is this is it stable or not? I can show you, for instance. Uh, yeah, it's stable. We have done it. Let me see. I can go to another presentation. I don't know how to do it. Um, yeah, okay, I've done it. I need to share. Well, I can tell you because I don't know how to do it. But yeah. we have done it on... Um, uh, Peptide MHC TCR uh, receptor. That is a big yeah, complex. Yeah. It's very stable. We can make mutations, and um, um, if you make if you mutate an anchor residue, it falls apart. If you mm -hmm. mutate residues that are not anchor, it stays together. So we are very happy about that. Okay. 
and, and for like disordered proteins, do you get, I mean, do you, how do you like uh, environmental effects you could model? Like I mean, some of them are disordered due to pH or temperature. Or that no, too. right now we do everything at constant temperature yeah, and constant, constant, uh, constant everything, constant okay. temperature, constant pressure and the neutral solution. Okay, and well, we that. are working also on incorporating um, or, or being transferable in uh, these variables. It just we need more training data, but we are working on it. We have a way to do it. It just we are uh, we are collecting the data to train the model. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, in your uh, reference at atomistic simulations, what force fields are you using? Your own force fields, and what happens no. if you use the most? I would say the most uh, widely used force field or other use other force fields. This is what we do in the atomistic simulation. We use the Amber, some version of Amber, I don't remember. And and does it change if you use another type of force field? We have world? done it. No, not much. Like uh, it changes, like for instance, I showed you for signaling, I showed you with two force reference force field. It okay. changes maybe the, the the relative weight of the minima. But the idea is that eventually, if we correct the experimental data, we should converge to one potential. Mm -hmm. And for the for the uh, solvent for the water, what are you doing? I don't remember. Maybe some tip, tip, tip well, one of the yoga. Yeah, things. yeah. I don't know which one. Uh, I'll need to ask my students. We are consistent uh, with the data set that we have. We use the same force field the same water model, and uh, we train on that. And also in your, you know, small proteins, you basically have one, you know, major state, major stable state, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're not, cannot use it to compare systems where you have two different states that are well established. You no, find- yeah, we no? can, we can. I mean, this is why we do it. Because no, but... the lathom is very difficult, but with our model, you can. But the, the all atoms don't give you, you know, the uh, th the second state, right? Give you many... no. But we don't. When it, once we have trained it on yeah. the peptides and small protein, we have a transferable force field, and we can simulate okay. other proteins. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Kitano. Thank you very much, Celia. That was great. Um, I, I would. It's this question is related to what Shoshona was asking. You, you actually showed a case where you identified an alternative folded state, although it, it seems to be pretty high energy. And I didn't quite catch what are the structural differences between the called native state and this alternative state. And do you have any thoughts about how one might determine experimentally whether yeah. that really exists? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um... The, this is an intrinsically disordered protein. So these are ensembles. These um, states are ensembles, very diverse. Right. So these are not two different alternative folds. Yeah, they are two different ensembles. Mostly yeah. the different packing of the secondary structure, but they are transient. One is more likely than the other. And, right. uh, and uh, we are collaborating with experimentalists to use FRET and uh, uh, NMR and uh, uh, yeah, different NMR parameters to uh, to test, uh, to compare with the experiments. I see, but it's not that you have two folded states, it, you, you have two ensembles of largely disordered states. We also have uh, cases where we have two folded state. Like- I thought you showed an example of that, right? Signaling, I... signaling is different packing. So there is the misregister state and the the what we call folded state because it's the global minimum and we get them. Okay, well, thank you. I think it's interesting to use those data to guide what experiments might, like where to put Yeah, that. exactly, yeah. This is why we do it because we want to predict states that can be tested experimentally. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other further questions or you want to go back to CAS predictions? We get new targets in half an hour. So I guess we are. I guess people are eager to wait for new targets. They're gonna load up the computers and and, and, then, we, and then for geese uh, simulation here we can, we can run some alternative states because we have a lot of 
but these fruits are big and there's also also RNA there, so they might be hard to get a good alternative yeah, states. Yeah, no. Uh, right but, now but we they, only do proteins, no RNA, yeah, no. Yeah, well, yeah. in the future maybe, but uh, right now we focus on proteins. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but thank you very much, Celia, thank and see much, all of you in September again. And I will yeah, have a, thanks, have a thanks nice summer. For, for holding you. these nice meetings, mm -hmm. <laughs> Arlie. Okay, Great. thank you. Bye. Have a nice summer. Bye-bye.